uh, DSA, DSA, Los Angeles, uh, everybody else around the country. Um, want to deeply thank you for this film. Um, can everyone hear me? First of all, I want to make sure we're we're okay. Okay, good. Yeah. So, um, Abby. The two questions that come to mind, I'll just ask them one after the other, um, would be uh, if you could tell us something about why you made this film, what led you to do it, um, and something about how you made this film. I know that, or at least I think I know that it was shot by Palestinians in Gaza and so forth. So I think everybody would be interested in, in both of those questions. So uh, take your time. This is for us to, to listen to you. Thank you, Rick. And thank you, uh, Jewish Voices for Peace, which has really been on the front lines, I think, of this consciousness shift, which is dramatically shifting um, the ability to really put pressure on Israel. And it's an incredible thing to see and also align ourselves with. Um, you know, we went on a countrywide tour of Gaza Fights for Freedom back in 2019, 2020, and a lot of the partnerships we had was with Jewish Voices for Peace, and in, especially in light of that poll that just came out that showed that one quarter of American Jews uh, feel that Israel is an apartheid state. So this is a huge facet and a huge component of that struggle, and so thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I decided to make the film alongside my partner, Mike Preisner, who I do Empire Files with back right in the wake of the Great March of Return. Uh, we had previously been in the West Bank, the occupied West Bank back in 2017. Uh, and we have a bunch of videos on the brutal military occupation there. And of course we tried to get it into Gaza. Uh, we filled out all the proper paperwork, we had the proper press credentials, and I was told by the Israeli press ministry that I was a propagandist, and I was alleged to be an Iranian spy. Um, so I was banned for life from the territory and probably from Israel now, uh, sadly. So, you know, I decided to work with Gazan journalists, hire an entire team of Gazan journalists uh, to film with their own, you know, have, have their voices really take us through this story. Um, and how I linked up with them right in the aftermath of the Great March of Return as it started in that, in that horrific um, bloody day in May where 60 Palestinians were, were mowed down in cold blood by Israeli snipers. And I had this meeting with uh, my colleagues in Gaza and they said, you know, how is the Western media depicting what's going on? Are they, are they talking about it any differently um, than they had before? in light of the resistance here. And, and unfortunately, as you just saw in the movie, the coverage was abysmal. It was disgraceful. Uh, it, it's told in the passive voice. I mean, I don't need to tell you guys how horrific the corporate media coverage is of Palestinians and it doesn't matter what they do. The Great March of Return was a mass peaceful demonstration and they were still met with extreme brutality and violence. Um, and so, you know, out of that conversation arose the idea of a collaboration through Empire Files to really do this story justice because it was such an incredible story, right? And no one was really telling it in the way that it should be told. And especially the day that Razan al Najjar died, I'm getting goosebumps all over my body because it, it, I think that really changed my life forever. The day she died and I thought, you know, this is, this is unbelievable. The propaganda push to obfuscate her murder from Israeli generals, from the political establishment to basically say, no, she was just killed accidentally. But then you had the maliciously doctored uh, video clip of her basically saying she was a human shield. So all of that put together, plus, you know, just uh, that UN report that came out that really conclusively documented these egregious war crimes. I thought, you know, this needs to be done. And so once we directed the interviews um, from the team of Gaza journalists, we saw how incredible the footage was. I mean, this is this is brilliant cine cine cinematography, excuse me. Asma Atiyah Hamad and Waz Mwaza, the two videographers that you saw, um, they were running toward bullets every single week, risking their lives to get this footage. And it was just the most incredible thing I've ever seen. Of course, the ability to work through this blockade was very difficult. 
It took us months and months to get the footage in small um, dribs and drabs when they had electricity day to day. And so the last footage that actually came in was that slow motion footage. And we just said, you know, th this, is, this is unbelievable. We have to really take six months to a year off and really put together a full length feature film because um, that's the only way this story could be done. And, you know, the Palestinians who, who put this together, I feel like really, you don't see many films just told directly from Palestinians themselves. It's a lot of kind of Western media depiction of what Palestinians want, how, they port how they're portrayed, which is always very dark, ominous, you know, um, kind of uh, framing. And so it was incredible to see, this is what Palestinians want to portray themselves. Uh, bright, full of love, full of heart, uh, desiring and longing for freedom. And so that I, I feel like, you know, and, and one last thing is that um, Razan's mother was actually the first one to see the film because she was very distraught at the way that the media had covered her daughter's murder. And so we decided to let her see the film first and she, she really loved it. And so she got, you know, we got the stamp of approval from Razan's mom. Um, and that really meant a lot to me. So, so thank you again. Um, and we, I really appreciate being here today. Well, thanks. Um, I noticed that there's a question in the chat. It's, it's uh, really about a, a detail, but maybe an important one that says, how did you get the soldiers video? Uh, they said it's devastating. I think it was. Um, anything yeah. you can tell us about that? Absolutely. So this this might shock some of you, but um, there was a group of soldiers who were actually freely sharing videos of themselves on the other side of the sniper rifles. So this was a Facebook group that a bunch of IDF soldiers were sharing videos of them murdering uh, children and unarmed protesters and basically laughing about it. Um, and this was leaked from the group and it was passed around. It was uh, very horrifying. Um, you know, Israeli politicians tried to tamp down on it and just say, oh, this is this is totally, you know, an aberration. This is an outlier. This isn't really what's going on. But, you know, I, I think that it's more mainstream than you'd like to think. And the fact that this was an entire group of soldiers passing this around uh, really speaks to how normalized this kind of behavior is. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'll just insert a quick anecdote about 15 years ago. Um, having my wife and I, having been associated with Zionist groups and having friends who are still Zionist, um, we were at an informal meeting at someone's house uh, and there was an article in Harper's Magazine about just this phenomenon, uh, soldiers gleefully shooting children uh, in Gaza. And I mentioned it to people, including someone who was on the Los Angeles county board of supervisors at the time and uh, you know they just laughed it off so um documenting this you know well i think you've said it in a different way art this goes towards consciousness and consciousness hopefully moves the situation uh and you did it really powerfully um i want to ask people to put questions that they might have into the chat and I'll try and stay on top of it to one extent or the other and ask Abby your question if I can, you know, uh, if I can stay up on it. Uh, Abby, we know that uh, you had a, for lack of a better way of putting it, a run in with the authorities on uh, your First Amendment rights uh, as it regards BDS, boycott, divestment, sanctions, which is the call from Palestinian civil society to take action against Israel for its crimes. Uh, so you had a run in, I believe it was in the state of Georgia. And I think people would like to hear something about that. I know I would. Is there, what can you tell us about that? Absolutely. So in February of 2020, I was supposed to give a keynote speech at Georgia Southern University, and I was uh, given a contract. Uh, saying that I need to pledge to never boycott the state of Israel in order to receive public funds from the state. Uh, I was aghast. I was floored. I had, of course, known about anti-BDS laws uh, previously. I did not know that 
I would be given such a contract uh, to sign my, away my First Amendment rights in order to receive funds as an independent contractor. Of course, I refused to sign and the entire conference was canceled. Uh, it fell apart. Uh, the organizers ghosted me. I was just absolutely shocked. I didn't know what to do. And so I just put the story out there just saying, you know, this happened. And I was contacted by CARE, an incredible ad advocacy group for, for Muslim rights and others, uh, you know, in the country that have been suppressed in the post 9-11 world. And so I worked with CARE and the Partnership for Civil Justice Fund to launch litigation against the state of Georgia uh, to advocate my constitutional rights, specifically the right to free speech, which is supposed to be the sacred cherished right, especially on college campuses around the country in the wake of, you know, conservatives bemoaning about cancel culture all the time, and also the right to uh, to peacefully boycott. This is a passive action. This is something that's been enshrined by the Supreme Court back during the Montgomery bus boycotts. This is an essential tool that we have to pressure corporations, governments. This is something that brought down apartheid in this country. This is something that brought, brought down apartheid in South Africa. So this is a very important thing that we need to hold dear. Um, the case was stalled out for quite a while. There was several direct attempts at foreign interference from Israeli consulate officials going to advocate uh, at the Georgia state legislature saying that they wanted to change the law to keep it on the books, but render my case moot. You had Israeli public officials taking to Twitter, basically threatening economic consequences um, in an abstract way in response to my case. And at the end of the day, after a, a quite a while, um, because of the stalling from COVID, uh, Judge Mark Cohen ruled that the law was unconstitutional and actually ruled in favor of my case. Now, what was interesting about the timing was that it was about a couple days after the last onslaught in Gaza ended. And although it might be coincidence, I do think that the public pressure that had been mounting here in this country and worldwide really did help facilitate that decision. Uh, but again, I mean, when you look at the judges in all of these cases, uh, Kansas, um, Texas, you know, there's 30 states in the U.S. that have anti-BDS laws on the books. And every time they have been challenged at the state level, judges have ruled them unconstitutional. And so it really shows you the strong armed attempt on behalf of the, on behalf of the Israeli lobby um, trying to capture our politicians to just throw everything at the wall and see what sticks because they know that these laws are necessary to preemptively hold back the tide of justice, to cause a mass chilling effect, um, to cause people to be scared, to do what is perfectly uh, the right thing to do, to stand on the right side of history. And so you see this now with Ben and Jerry's, the incredible momentum and the incredible decision on behalf of the independent board of Ben and Jerry's to make this decision to divest, not just from the West Bank, from it, but from Israel as well. And the pressure campaign and the litigation that is being attempted to silence them and to actually punish them economically, not just from Israeli politicians, but U.S. politicians, is astounding. And it also shows you that they are desperate. They are desperate. And this case will have a monumental impact and set an incredible precedent moving forward that if Ben and Jerry's is able to follow through on this without being economically um, punished by these anti-BDS laws. Hopefully other corporations will follow suit if, if enough pressure is applied. So it's all part of this, this larger struggle um, for BDS. And it's incredible. The more people are realizing that these laws are on the books, I think, uh, you know, the more pressure will mount and hopefully more plaintiffs will take them on. Yeah, uh, ice cream terrorism is, <laughs> is a new thing. Yeah, who, who would have thought, you know? Uh, I just bought a whole bunch of Ben and Jerry's the other night. I'm, I, I love it. And you absolutely love to see it. It's a huge, huge thing. So yes to excess calories and <laughs> feed me Seymour. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, you're an independent journalist. Uh, I would think more, uh, more exposed. You, you probably don't have an entire floor of, of powerful attorneys uh, defending you. Although you, you know, some people came, uh, to the to the call for justice, but uh, the pushback uh, that all of us engaged in this struggle uh, feel at one point or another, uh, I would think 
you would feel more of it, but I'm curious to know what you sense or what you have experienced in terms of pushback beyond the BDS uh, case that you were involved in, in terms of trying to get your movie uh, to the public and in, in terms of either reviews or rebukes or what kind of reactions you've had from uh, the mainstream press uh, that uh, uh, which is still there it hasn't completely come apart yet. Um, Rick, I will tell you that it's been, I think the rule is to just ignore. Um, yeah. You know, I think that there's a couple layers here, you know, Israel's a little bit more flagrant in terms of uh, the attacks, you know, calling me an Iranian agent, basically banning me from entry. But in terms of the U.S. corporate media, I would say as soon as I entered the field of professional journalism back when I was uh, working for RT, um, there was a lot of slander and smears and marginalization of my voice in, in corporate media, um, basically just loving a bunch of insults, including that I was an anti-Semite because I dared to compare uh, methods of, um, you know, forced sterilization of Ethiopian Jews to basically uh, Nazis, um, which of course took a eugenics program from the U.S. So it's all it's all a big circle here. But but because of those statements and of course criticism of the egregious war crimes that Israel was committing back during 2012, what they called Operation Pillar Pillar of Cloud, um, I was I was quite criticized and basically that just set the precedent now where if you just google my name if you look at my wikipedia it's just a laundry list um, of unfair attacks and smears against my character and that's really i think what the corporate media likes to do first they they marginalize you and discredit you most importantly because of course you know these search engines and things like wikipedia they had they cite only corporate media sources and so when the corporate media toes the line of the pentagon especially in terms of israel palestine um, that's all you really need to kind of be a career ender and so that's why this is a third rail issue you know this is why people do not touch it because of this uh really really um horrific weaponization of anti-Semitism, a very real and growing threat around the world. And to weaponize it to shut down criticism of an apartheid government is, is extremely disingenuous and unfair, but people are scared. People are scared to do it because they know what the consequences will be and they don't want to take the risk. I've, I've talked to several journalists um, who have just said this, look, I, I agree with you, but I'm, it's not worth the risk. You know, and even their managers or their producers, they, they just say, look, it, it's just something that you don't touch. And so ever since then, um, my work has basically virtually been ignored by corporate media. Um, and that's exactly what happened with this movie. The movie came out, it, it fell on deaf ears largely. Uh, we could barely get it shown or seen in any sort of um, distribution networks. And I even met with, with people who are plugged into the scene here in Los Angeles and they just said, look, there's no way that this movie is gonna get out there. It's a well done movie. But there's no way, there's too much bias. Um, it, it's very obvious what the intent and advocacy of the movie is, and there's just no way that it's gonna be seen. And so we had to go direct distribution model, which is just putting it up ourselves on Vimeo and just working with our grassroots networks around the country, working with JVP chapters and pro-Palestine solidarity networks to get it shown in local movie theaters. And we've been hosting just small screenings just like this ever since. Uh, a couple months ago in May, when Israel went on that brutal um, bombing campaign, we decided, right, what, what preceded that, of course, was the ethnic cleansing in Sheikh Jarrah, and we decided, look, it's time to put this up for free. Um, we, this, this needs to be seen by as many people as possible, and, and so we've decided to put it for free, and luckily, um, it, I think it's been a really good tool for people to understand the scope of what we're talking about here, especially when it's about peacefully resisting, because a lot of this press is obfuscates, of course, what Palestinians do. And, you know, it's just this, it's constructed as this ancient struggle over religion, these two states that are warring, and there'll never be peace in the Middle East. It's very patronizing. Um, and so it's really important to have films like this that just have a clear cut case um, that you can't deny war crimes have taken place. And, and that's really the purpose is to hopefully use something like this to eventually show at The Hague when, I, when the ICC finally does try Israel for war crimes. Yeah, 
definitely, uh, this would be uh, a wonderful thing to put in front of international jurists. But in the meantime, it is a wonderful thing that you've, I think, so skillfully combined the documentary evidence that uh, you know clearly indicts the crimes that we witnessed through your film and the humanizing interviews with the people that actually you know stand for their own cause and, and have suffered for their own cause what kept occurring to me by doing that I think what you showed us was that in fact the Palestinians have one thing that I don't think most of us in the United States have, as speaking as a middle class uh, white privileged guy, um, which is each other. You know, they really have each other in such a meaningful way because they have no choice but to have each other. And I think the film really gave us that and humanized each individual. They weren't snippets, they were full interviews. They had the thoughts and feelings of the people most centrally involved. And that's kind of like 180 degrees from what we call news. Uh, you know, we get everything but that really, and we don't get the documentary uh, evidence either. So, um, you know, yes, you're, it, it, it is frustrating, I'm sure, to put so much work into something that I will just subject, subjectively say is a, a a work of great excellence and great dedication, and yet to have it blocked. And at the same time, uh, both you and us see the statistics of awareness of the Palestinian cause, even amongst Jews, 25% uh, in the last poll, agreeing that it's apartheid, uh, it, Israel is an apartheid state and so forth. And the awareness 22% amongst Jews talking about genocide, which, you know, if you're Jewish in this country, you you can't really use that word in polite conversation because it's not polite. But um, what do you see going forward once you've done this? I, I'm a little embarrassed to ask because I think you've done something that will last and will continue to reverberate amongst people here. Um, you mentioned Sheikh Jarrah. Do you know of, or are you thinking of any future projects um, to, to go going forward? Uh, or are you more concentrating on just accompanying this film out into the public in every way you can, such as what we're doing today? Um, for, first to your comment about just kind of the sanitization uh, on behalf of the political establishment and corporate owned media apparatus to never tell us what Palestinians think and feel. And so we're always, it's kind of implicitly, you know, uh, seeded out there that Palestinians all agree with terrorism and they're, they, they're a death cult and they all wanna kill Jews. All of this is this hypothetical scenario that there will be a second Holocaust, essentially. That is the foundation of why there's this undying allegiance between this country and, and the state of Israel. And I think on the flip side, which re what's really fascinating about it is that Israelis are also sanitized to the American public. We never hear about what the average Israeli on the street thinks. And so one thing that I love to do every time I'm anywhere doing on the ground reporting is just get a snapshot of where society is at. Uh, whether it's Palestine or Israel. And, and that's exactly what I did through these series of interviews uh, in Jerusalem one day that I was there. And, and it's quite shocking. Um, you know, in the film, I felt like I did want to show the Israeli side in terms of what their carefully constructed propaganda model and the Hasbara to respond to what we saw, the, the brutality unleashed on Palestinians. And so it was the, you know, the Hasbara clips, the IDF propaganda memes and all of that. And of course, the politicians and IDF spokespeople that speak English, you know, Hebrew is the national language of Israel. They are speaking to us. They are directed to go out on the media and tell us what they want us to hear. Mm -hmm. And so it's just curious why you never actually hear from either side in terms of what people really think. And I think if we were opened up to that, it would be quite shocking for the majority of people. Where do I see this going? I have never been more optimistic, to be honest. Um, I, I would say that in the last bombing raid, 
that we saw in the wake of the ethnic cleansing going on in Silwan and Sheikh Jarrah, um, the unprecedented mobilizations. Let's just start there. The fact that historic uh, mass protests took place, 60,000 in LA, that is unheard of. That's never been done before. Um, you know, this was happening all over the country, all over the world. I think Israel for the last 20 years has lost the PR game slowly and steadily. And I think it's cemented its loss with that last onslaught that they can no longer ask, or I'm sorry, they can no longer claim that they are acting in self-defense. That's out the window. So all they have now are these trumped up charges that anti-Semitism is on the rise because of pro-Palestine solidarity activism, which is insulting and untrue. Um, and they know that they've lost that PR battle because the world has been looking at Israel and saying, this is not acceptable. And they've tried to punish Israel with UN resolutions, countless toothless resolutions that have no power because the US continues to hold veto power over the UN Security Council. The US has something in place called the Hague Invasion Act, where we have given ourselves the authority to actually invade the country that's holding potential war criminals with our allies. I mean, it really does come back to the US empire. And that is why the responsibility lies on the shoulders of the American people, because this is the country that is subsidizing these atrocities. Um, and without pressure on this government, I fear the change will take a lot longer to happen, but that change is happening here and it's happening quickly and things can happen very, very quickly. You look 15 years ago in the anti-war movement, you know, when we were opposing the Iraq war, organizing against the war on terror, mixing that pro-Palestine solidarity message was actually seen as taboo. People said, don't, you know, this is not the same struggle. This is too controversial. Uh, fast forward to today, and you actually cannot enter anti-war, anti-imperialist spaces or organizing if you are not pro-Palestine. This notion of being liberal except for Palestine is a nonsensical, untenable idea that does not, frankly, it does not exist anywhere except elite liberal circles and you know, basically the reverberations of the echo chambers of the corporate media and, and the liberal political establishment. And, and that is the reality on the ground. It has dramatically shifted. And it's due to things like the flotilla massacre, the 2014 bombing massacre, and what just happened in May. You know, every time Israel does this, they lose more and more, and they are getting desperate. And they know that this is not sustainable. And I don't know what they think they can do moving forward, because every time they do this, public opinion becomes more and more aware. Every time there's an event like this that happens, people are like, hey, you know, I, I'm ready to learn. I'm ready to, to finally see what is the truth about Israel-Palestine? What, you know, they're ready. They're ready. And, and what we just saw was millions of more people waking up, millions of more people looking at the material and finally realizing that, hey, this isn't the most complicated issue in the world. This is actually one of the most simple. This is a case of an occupied nation that is being brutally colonized and subjugated and oppressed. Five million people denied basic dem democratic rights. And once you explain to Americans that this is about democracy, notions that we cherish in this country, democracy, human rights, human mobility, dignity, um, I think people tend to fall on the right side once they understand the issue. And I've never been more confident that we will see the fall of apartheid because they cannot go anywhere but down moving forward. They can't, we, the line has already been drawn in the sand. This is an apartheid state. We have sitting politicians agreeing with this. Congress people finally, for the first time saying, this is apartheid. You can't turn the clock back and say, oh no, 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 it's not apartheid. Now the conversation becomes, what can we do about apartheid? We're all on the same page now. You have Bet Salem and Israeli human rights organization saying that on the record. Human Rights Watch, notoriously bad on the issue, saying that. Now the organizing comes. Now the BDS struggle mounts. Now we move forward, linking the pro-Palestine movement with all of the struggles in the streets. How do we bring peace in the Middle East? Well, this is a very, very important facet that undercuts it all. Palestinian dignity and human rights. 
Uh, I will never stop covering this issue. You know, since this movie was made, every time Israel does anything, and every time Palestine is in the news, we use the material that we've compiled, whether it's the documentation in the West Bank, this movie, we're going to keep using it over and over again to get the truth out. I have a podcast series ongoing talking about the Zim Israeli weapons shipment blockade that was done from Block the Boat organizers. How can that be replicated across the country? That was a huge success. Ben and Jerry's, I have the inner struggle. That fight is far from over. We need to lend support to the independent board of Ben and Jerry's and, and say that keep going. Um, and, and, you know, everyone who's, who's doing things that show that when we fight, we can win on this topic. We're highlighting them constantly on Empire Files, and we will continue to do so. I just went on Joe Rogan's show a couple of weeks ago, which is the most popular podcast in the entire world. And I talked at length for an hour and a half about Palestine alone and, and tried to provide some context about what's going on. So I, I live and breathe this issue because I, I know that it is crucially it is a crucial component of the anti-imperialist struggle and it needs to be at the forefront of everything that we do. And we can't let it fall by the wayside. We can't let 70 more children die. Children are dying every day. There's, there's, there's protests going on right now, akin to the Great March of Return at the partition. And a small child was just shot in the head by an Israeli sniper. This is going on right now. We cannot forget that, that these people are living and breathing the struggle every single day. And this is still happening ever since that onslaught finished. People are still getting shot. That policy continues, the shoot to kill policy. And also in the West Bank, people are getting shot every day. Roundups of hundreds of people thrown in jail with no charges or trial. And so it's really about keeping that consciousness alive, keeping it alive and making people realize, don't let it go, don't let it fall away. Keep this on the forefront of your mind. Keep our Palestinian brothers and sisters right there in your heart. Because until they are free, none of us are free. You know, so often um, one sees an interview with a terrific author or filmmaker where it's obvious that their expression is most articulate in their uh, chosen art form. But you've been very articulate I think we've seen a, a larger answer as to why you made this film uh, because of the depth of your understanding of it and your ability to articulate it is, is just wonderful. Uh, I think most of the people on this, on this Zoom and the people that will see it afterward need, uh, we need ourselves to awaken ourselves. And you've really helped with that. Before we leave, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, before we finish, I just wanna read a couple brief comments from Reverend Marcia Hoffman, who is one of our committee members. She's with United Church of Christ, who has been doing great work, uh, or which has been doing great work on Palestine. She says, what I continually hear from quotes, good Christian people, close quote is, quote, but the poor Israelites. Many think that Palestinians are trying to extinguish all of Israel which this film shows us is the exact opposite. We keep struggling with how we bring more people into the truth. Um, I think that's partly a description of your film. This is one way how we're doing that. And thank you, Marcia. Um, and someone else, uh, Benjamin, I'm sorry that I used last names because I that was unintentional because I don't want to keep anybody from getting in Israel next time they try, uh, <laughs> including myself. Mary but, Mission is watching. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, Benjamin says, correct, but the Christian right can make those claims for and about Israel, and the Christian right will be believed in this country. There's a lot of truth to that, Benjamin, but I'll take a small exception, uh, if you'll permit. Uh, and I've actually seen data that says there is slippage on the pro-Zionist uh, uh, Christian right. Um, and I think this kind of information and this kind of clarity of information, um, you know, is gonna chip away at anybody that hears it. And um, if you'll forgive us uh, another small personal anecdote, um, 
we had here in Los Angeles, we had uh, two cousins of mine from uh, Chicago who are Orthodox people, Orthodox Jews who came here. And um, I was kind of surprised, surprised and shocked by the question my cousin asked me, you're not an anti-Zionist, are you? And I <laughs> said, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Guilty is charged, and we had actually a very nice conversation about it, uh, which was also a big surprise because uh, many of those conversations turn out not to be nice. Um, but it was very interesting. They have three kids, and one of them, uh, who is an attorney, is uh, thinking more in our direction than in what he was brought up to think of within the confines of Orthodox Judaism. So you never know. Um, you know, uh, as the man said, the harder they come, the harder they fall. So, you know, yeah, uh, we're so encouraged. I think I can speak for everybody on this call. We, we are so encouraged by the excellence of your work, the excellence of the people that you chose and the job they did in Palestine. And um, I think my... Um, uh, my uh, gas tank is full on the level of inspiration moving forward on this issue uh, because I'm going to be talking to people about how great this film is, even though this is the second time I saw it. And I, I, I just want to say one other thing. You didn't shy away from the kinds of things that made this hard to watch. And the reality, as painful as it is, I think, speaking for myself, I need to see it again, too, because I live in a bubble, as most of us do. And um, it feels good to know you're part of the world and part of the reality of the world, even the painful part. But the, the, the striving of these people to see the mother of that nurse being able to have the composure. I mean, I can't even keep my composure just thinking about it. But I have a daughter, and that's what I thought about. The amazing steadfastness, uh, composure of these people. Thank you for bringing that to us. Is there anything else you'd like to say uh, to our vast, well, maybe not vast, but uh, dedicated audience uh, before we let you go? Sure, just a couple parting words. Yeah, I mean, the strength and resilience of the Palestinians never ceases to amaze and inspire me. Um, and of course, Razan's mother's words, you know, we don't want we don't want compassion. I think she said, we want our rights. We don't want you to feel sorry for us. We want our rights. And that really is a wake up call to us. Um, like you just said, if you're not outraged, then you're not paying attention. And we have to remain outraged. We have to continue to educate ourselves on, you know, on this subject and, and continue to spread this awareness because this whole partnership of Israel and the United States relies on the ignorance of the American public. That's really what it is. Um, and that's, that's being chipped away, slowly but surely. And one last comment about just what we just saw, these protests that were mobilized around the country. I mean, when Rashida Tlaib confronted Joe Biden on the tarmac, and let's say a week prior, he was on the phone with Netanyahu, and he said, take as much time as you need. He said, you have carte blanche, carry out this operation and Netanyahu actually turned to the Knesset and he said, we, we have as much time as we need, repeating the words of Joe Biden. Fast forward a week later, after tens of thousands of people were in the streets, after the relentless, you know, all the New York Times publishing the 70 children on the front page. That was, that was new, right? Yeah. Even journalists in the corporate media can't stay silent about this anymore. After the bombing of residential towers in broad daylight, mini 9-11s happening all over Gaza. After that, Joe Biden said, you know what? I can't hold back the pressure anymore. You have to find a solution to this. And that's when it ended. And what does that say? It says that pressure works, activism works, and protests work. And that is up to us. We have to keep generating the outrage. We have to keep mobilizing in the streets because no policy has ever moved or shifted without massive amounts of people demanding it. And I, you know, again, 
um, I am extremely optimistic. I'm extremely optimistic about where this is going and, uh, and it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing to be a part of. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm delighted and honored. And uh, I would love to meet you guys in person soon, hopefully in a post COVID uh, scenario, but, but keep it up, keep up the fight. Uh, it's, it's really beautiful to have uh, brothers and sisters like you on board and, and to be pursuing this. And I just really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, one little coda, we asked you and you responded for things people can do to support Palestinians, <clears throat> excuse me, in their struggle. So, um, Ben, I don't know if we can put them in the chat now or they're already there, um, but they include supporting the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, of course, um, and calling and writing your elected representatives and telling them to end the illegal blockade on Gaza. Um, and finally, uh, donate to organizations working in Palestine that need support need our support like uh, we are not numbers and um, of course you can look to the jvp uh, jvp.org for resources you can contact us for resources um, thank you so much abby for making this film and taking your time to be with us um, and everything you've said is really really helpful to us and um, Thank you so much. We will look forward to meeting you in person and uh, clicking glasses on at least a Turkish coffee or something. <laughs> Thank you so much, you guys. Have a wonderful day. Viva Palestine. And uh, when we fight, we will win. Thanks so much. Thanks to everybody. Okay, see you all later. I'm not going to end the call quite yet, just so everyone can open up links from the chat. Right. But we will include those in a follow-up email. Thank you so much for doing this. Excellent. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us. It was well done. It was really fantastic to have Abby on. Great. Um, does, does it... Most of the names I recognize are people that um, know a, a lot about this subject, but I don't rec I don't know a lot of the names. So, does anybody have any basic informational questions? You know, like where's Gaza or whatever. You know, really seriously, no stupid questions because this is a a subject hidden, you know, from public view in the main. Um, so while I allow things to uh, load up in the chat. Um, I'll just tell you this uh, one factoid you can use in your next conversation about Gaza, which is, as you know, it's about half the square miles of the San Fernando Valley. And in 2014, according to Betselem, it was the recipient of 20,000 tons of Israeli explosives, which is four times the tonnage of explosives of the Hiroshima bomb. I guess that's because they're bad people. But anyway, you know, I'm being sarcastic. Uh, but uh, anything anybody else wants to say before we leave? Does anybody know why we can't copy what's in the chat? Yeah. I can't yes, sorry. Chat. That's, um, it's a setting that's on my uh university provided school account got it thank you yeah you know imagine if like palestine was the valley and israel was the west side and we were shooting missiles at each other that's i mean it's interesting when you put it into that to visualize like just the valley yeah half the valley i think it's 147 square miles so, you know, and there's, there's a little over 1 million people in the valley. So if you cut it in half, that would be half million people density versus 2 million. So it's four times the dense population density. And just imagine if you needed, if never in your life could you or your children ever, eat, you know, go to the beach or for that matter, uh, go over the Cuenga Pass ever. <laughs> you know, never leave the valley. 
Yeah, I mean, if, yeah. No, I know, we shouldn't laugh, but it's just funny. Yeah, no, I mean, it's bad enough that they're taking away green blacks. Yeah. <laughs> I can't, I, I don't understand the reasoning for Egypt to continue to block the Palestinians. I mean, I'm not sure if it's just a re refugee thing, but, you know, I've been to Cairo um, a few times and I know that there is a lot of support for the Palestinians there. So I don't understand why, you know, the people, I, I, I know that there, there are, are people who would be very much okay with the borders being open with Palestine. I, I know that there's some money going on there where the, the Egyptians are getting a bunch of money, I guess, in order to keep that border closed. But I, I, I don't know, maybe it's a, I feel like if the Palestinians were able to go into Egypt and at least do trade with them from that port, then they wouldn't be so isolated. I mean, right now it is like, it's, it's very much a prison. And um, I just put into the chat the, uh, a link to basically, you know, the oil and gas reserves that are under Palestine. I think that they probably would have never given up Gaza at all or pulled out, pulled out any of the settlers if they had known that they were such huge. They, they found out, you know, these massive, massive uh, uh, oil and gas reserves, mostly under Palestinian territory and waters. And I think that's one of the reasons why they didn't want the flotilla in the waters because they know that they want to do those off offshore drillings. They're already, you know, I don't know. I, I don't, uh, and who's speaking? What's your first name, please? Oh, just, my name's Lisa. Lisa? Hi, Lisa. Yeah, uh, just to address that, Lisa, and anyone else is free to respond as well. I think $2 billion from the United States in military aid annually, just think what that would do for the Valley. Um, you know, that um, might be substantial pressure to accept the American way of viewing things, which means to support Israel. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more to it than that, but it is a, a dictatorship so that the sentiment, the pro-Palestinian sentiment that you spoke about may not have any outlet whatsoever uh, as it did under the Morsi government. They did have some flexibility, quite a bit of flexibility with Egypt um, until the coup that put in Sisi, the dictator that's right. currently there. So that, I don't know much more than that, if anybody else does. Well, I mean, for Egypt, it's not a matter of being pro-Palestinian or anti-Palestinian or pro-Israeli, anti-Israeli. Um, the sentiments in Egypt are clear. They're pro-Palestinian and anti-Israel but the sentiments of the government and the obligations of the government are to make to remain compatible with american imperialism perfectly and just continue the corruption that was under you know uh what is it mubarak yeah. it's just that's basically all it is you know it's just another dictator that's going to be you know stealing government resources because it's not like all the people get it they don't you know, I think there's also a psychological thing working that we've seen in a lot of different respects, which is when you've got uh, disproportionate power over other people and you start wielding it in a self-aggrandizing way, you um, somehow humiliation, inflicting humiliation becomes an end in itself whether that's just you know the psychological distortions of people who rise to those kinds of leadership positions in you know colonial settler states or dictatorships i don't know but it's evident that that is part of what's driving the behavior because there's no operational reason to do a lot of the things that we even saw in this film it, it doesn't benefit israel uh operationally uh these people are powerless anyway they're inside the walls of that prison and they can't get out so but they're you know in order to keep that thing afloat i think you have to engender and incentivize cruelty and i don't know that's my take um, anybody else go for it 
Well, I think when we may see things changing since just recently,